Russia will start deploying tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus in about a month. This is Moscow's first move of such warheads outside of Russia since the fall of the Soviet Union, taking the war to another dangerous level. And just like before, the U.S. and NATO have slammed Putin's and Belarus's plans. Does this mean the Russian president will actually use tactical nuclear weapons? What about Ukraine and NATO? What kind of plans do they have for retaliation? Well, in this edition of the Spotlight, we will look at the latest when it comes to the Ukraine war, which appears set to continue with the U.S.'s $2.1 billion in additional military assistance. First, let me introduce our guests. Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst, joins us from Raleigh, North Carolina. Also joining us, Don DeBar, activist and commentator from Austin, in New York. Welcome to you both. Ray McGovern, I'll start with you. Uh, Russia starting uh, making an announcement uh, of deploying tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus in about a month's time. Um, give us your reaction on that. And uh, I, I don't know if you saw the uh, footage when he was si sitting with the Belarusian president at that table. And they were, uh, I think they were having brunch maybe or something. But it was in a very, very casual setting. And he wasn't wearing a tie. And uh, the way he delivered it, uh, I think uh, that setting was meant to send a message also, if you saw the footage. I didn't see the footage, but to hear you describe it, I think you're quite right. Uh, this is a decision that was announced in March, uh, and they said it would be July uh, when these warheads would be introduced into Belarus. Um, it is dangerous. Uh, one can simply say, well, NATO has, uh, has those warheads in five NATO countries, uh, Germany, Holland, uh, Belgium, Italy, and Turkey. Uh, and this is kind of a tit-for-tat move on the part of Putin because he has, of course, rejoined, well, what's the big objection here? You have these in five countries. Let's get rid of them all. That would be a bargaining chip. But on the surface or on the ground here, it's very dangerous. Uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a, a, ta a tangible indication of why Mr. Biden can't have it both ways. He can't defeat Russia and avoid World War III. We veteran intelligence professionals have been trying to tell him that for several months here. You can't have it both ways, okay? The Russians consider Ukraine an existential threat the way NATO has been building up there. They're not gonna stop. They have the upper hand. Look at the map for Pete's sake. And today, of course, after four days of this counteroffensive, the Ukrainians have lost tens of tanks. People are saying 50. Two days ago, they're saying 100 now. These were the supercharged uh, tanks and the supercharged military trained and equipped by NATO. It's not going well. So, in, in Bottom line here is that the United States, and that's who's driving all this, has to decide whether it's going to uh, kind of regroup and go back to the drawing board, or, or whether it's going to kind of say, all right, that's enough, and there are signs that they're throwing Zelensky under the bus. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll get to you on that, but let me ask Don mm -hmm. DeBar. Uh, our guest, Ray McGovern, talks about how um, maybe the U.S. should either rethink his strategy, go to the drawing board, but with this latest announcement of $2.1 billion in further military assistance, it doesn't look like uh, they're up for that. They want this war to continue, correct? Yeah. You know, just uh, as far as the casual attire goes, it's, I think in Sochi is where they are, right? Nobody was wearing a green T-shirt. I did catch some of that. So, <laughs> did you see the footage? I, they're doing better than the other side. Um, you know, Ray's quite right about the, uh, first, there's five countries in NATO that have U.S. weapons on, on their territory, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, that were not, so really, those nations are not supposed to have nuclear weapons because that's how it laid out in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. There were five people, five uh, countries that had uh, exploded nuclear devices before January 1st, 1967. That was the U.S., the Soviet Union, the U.K., France, and China. And uh, there were, are four other countries that we know have them that either are not signatories or said, we don't care, we're having them anyway. 
uh, that's uh, India, Pakistan, uh, DPRK, uh, and then Israel, which try, doesn't admit that they have them, but everyone knows they have them. When the U.S. was negotiating that treaty, that no one's going to be, no one else is going to be allowed to have nuclear weapons, they were in the process of negotiating the same kind of an arrangement that Russia is making now with Be Belarus. In other words, well, we're, they're going to be our nuclear weapons that are on your territory, so Germany doesn't have nuclear weapons. The U.S. has nuclear weapons in Germany. So this is, you know, a, a tit for tat on, on that particular score. And, and Ray's right about it being dangerous. And, and, and what's more dangerous in my view, though, the U.S. activities in Ukraine invite nuclear weapons use. Russia has two prongs to its nuclear, uh, you know, the use of uh, nuclear uh, uh, doctrine. First is we will use nuclear weapons in a retaliatory strike against someone that uses them against us. And the other is we will use them in the event that the existence of our state is threatened. And the U.S., after that was re-enunciated by President Putin last year, proceeded to, A, start hosting conventions through the State Department uh, called uh, uh, to, to undo the Russian empire, basically. I can't remember the term of art they used. But in essence, to break up the Russian state into constituent parts. And then, as we saw last month, they tried to hit on the leadership. They tried to decapitate uh, with a drone of the right. uh, state. So, you know, it's, it seems to me that there's an awful lot of escalatory dangerous moves being made. And, and finally, we don't have John Kennedy in the White House this time by any means. <laughs> okay, uh, Ray McGovern, uh, you said something very interesting at the end there. If you care to elaborate on that, please. Yes, uh, you probably are referring to the signs that I see. Yes. Uh, that some people in Washington are prepared to throw Zelensky under the bus. There was a very, very interesting article in the Washington Post slash CIA, since the Post gets its stuff from the CIA, and actually quotes CIA sources here. And what did it say? Well, let me, let me ask you to guess. What is the worst thing you could accuse anybody of in the last couple of years? Right. Blowing up Nord Stream. We're not talking about the damn dam now. We're talking about... <laughs> Nord Stream. Guess who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, according to CIA sources who got it from liaison, and now in the front page of the Washington Post, the Ukrainian government. Now, they don't say it was Zelensky, they say it was uh, uh, Zaluzhny, you know, the head of the armed forces, but it was trained saboteurs that went down. Ukrainian government sponsored and Ukrainian government doing all this. And so they, it was these guys. This is the counter narrative now to Cy Hirsch. It was these people who blew up the, the pipeline. We know that because a, a European uh, liaison service has told us that. Well, my goodness. Now they blame it on this, uh, you know, this Pentagon leak fellow. But the Washington Post has a bevy of such things. Whether or not they came from Jack Thixair or not doesn't really matter. What matters is what they choose to put on their front page in response to what the CIA tells them to do. So there, there are those signs. There are also the sign that immediately after the dam, now we're not talking about Nord Stream, we're talking about that damn dam, okay? <laughs> when, it, when, it was, when it was ruined, when it was exploded, well, you know, Zelensky immediately blamed, blamed the Russians, so did Stoltenberg. Uh, so did Joseph Borrell. Uh, uh, MSNBC immediately repeated it was the Russians. An hour later, they got the memo. And the memo says, we're looking into this. We don't know. Both each side is accusing the other. And as far as I know, that's still the established line by John Kirby and all the others. So, hey, here's another ex example. Well, do you believe, uh, which one no do you believe? Do you believe that? There's no need for Zelensky anymore. Now, Ray McCarvin, do you believe the Washington Post, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, CIA sourced information given out on this uh, dam explosion? Or do you think that uh, this was directed maybe by the U.S.? Because previously um, you had Hirsch who had said that it was the U.S. that did that in one form or another. But now you're having this version of the Washington Post put out. Now you're talking about Nord Stream again, right? Yes. Nord Stream? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, after Hirsch came out with his article, it took the 
CIA a, a, a month to compare notes with German intelligence, come up with an alternative story, which, you know, six Ukrainians and one doctor walk into a bar, no, walk onto a yacht and this. That was ridiculous. That was a month ago. Now they're blaming the Ukrainian government. And so what I'm saying here is that <clears throat> if somebody wants to get rid of Z uh, Zelensky, and I think there is a coterie within the U.S. leadership, not in the State Department, but in the military and perhaps in the CIA and other potent forces there, well, this is, this is what you can blame the Ukrainians on. Who's in charge? Zelensky. And the, the, the delay, you know, again, this is transition now from Nord Stream to the dam. To the dam. Uh, the dam bursting, well, you would expect the U.S. to, to repeat uh, immediately what Zelensky said. They didn't. What Stoltenberg or what Burrell said, no, they didn't. As far as I know, they're still saying, well, we're trying to figure out who did this. That's big. And that's a little sign that there's a faction, at least, in Washington that wants to be a little able to redress this thing, go back to the drawing board, and maybe, just maybe, throw in the towel. Uh -huh. All right, let, let, let's take a look at um, the uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, uh, facts here. Based on the research we've done, Don DeBar, uh, we're looking at uh, how Russia has around 2,000 of these tactical warheads. The U.S. has around 200, half of which are at bases in Europe. Uh, so uh, a simple math would mean that 100 in Europe uh, the Russian, Russia to have 2,000 in their possession. Now, back in March, when Kiev was posed for a counteroffensive, you had the former Russian President Medvedev warning that uh, attempts by Ukraine were a threat to the very existence of the Russian state. Uh, and he said that that's something that warrants a nuclear response under Russia's security doctrine. Now, we're looking at a counteroffensive which by all means has started. Even uh, Putin has said that the U.S. came up with a weird way of saying I think it was Joe Biden that was quoted as saying, I think it has started. Probably I'm not too I sure think. what that means. Uh, now, uh, what do you think? Are, are, are we looking at Russia really to go ahead with using it since we're looking at a counteroffensive that has started already? Of course, uh, Russia says in July. There's something to keep in mind, and that is this war is going on on Russia's borders, not, not the U.S. border, not even the real core NATO border. Okay, Germany has Poland and the Baltics, um, you know, between it and uh, and the Balkans, between it and Russia, and and Ukraine, as a matter of fact. Um, so, um, first, in terms of an existential threat, this this is literally an existential threat for the Russian state, a and it is also apparently an existential threat for NATO. In a in a sense, they've painted themselves into a corner where if they don't win, quote unquote, whatever that is, or, or something that they can at least position as winning, uh, they're not going to be able to stop the ascension of, you know, the BRICS countries or whatever this new Megillah is that's rising, that's going to supplant the hegemon, has already supplanted it as a hegemon anyway. Um, you know, it's, a, it's really not a very good position to be in. And, and, and there's another aspect to it, too. You know, I alluded before to the Cuban Missile Crisis, sort of collaterally. Um, in uh, October of 1962, according to accounts from uh, Robert McNamara, the former Secretary of Defense, Fidel Castro, uh, the memoirs of Nikita Khrushchev, uh, others, and, and Bobby Kennedy also in 13 days, uh, the reason that we didn't have uh, World War III in 1962, nuclear war at that time, according to McNamara, was dumb luck. But according to Bobby Kennedy and others, uh, it was because of the civilian control of the military and the intelligence agencies uh, that was exercised at that point because there was, uh, they wanted to go to war, everyone but the civilian uh, government. Here, we have a, governor, a government that's clearly been installed by, in the case of Biden, um, and certainly uh, with the permission of and peopled by uh, the intelligence agencies. And they're in charge, and the Pentagon is in charge of policy. And we don't have anyone that can really stand up to them. And clearly, that's who's engineered this condition in the first place. In other words, our intelligence agencies have stupidly put us into a position where we either have to have 
threaten the existence of, of the Russian state, which we know what that means, uh, or uh, suffer a humiliating defeat. And that was something that Kennedy warned against, as a matter of fact. Uh, John and Robert Kennedy warned never, they, what they learned from October 1962 was never put either nuclear superpower in a position where they have to either fight nuclear war or suffer a humiliating defeat. And that's exactly the position we're in right now with, I, I hate to be cruel, but with a, patient, a dementia patient in charge. Uh, Literally. Do you recall, uh, Ray McGovern, when uh, there was a recent uh, NATO meeting that took place and you had Jan Stoltenberg, which uh, seems like this is his last term as a NATO Secretary General. Uh, I'm not too sure how effective of a leader he was if he was driven by the U.S. in almost all uh, respects. But he came out and he said that uh, we can't give Ukraine a security guarantee. So I think what we should do is we should uh, make sure that Ukraine gets provided with uh, military hardware uh, on a monthly basis and for NATO countries to contribute to that. What do you, what do you make of that? Uh, I'm trying to figure what that means. Does that mean that they want this situation, uh, maybe not to this intensity, to just continue? and then for them to provide Ukraine with weapons when it's needed and for their, because we know the war really started back in 2014, didn't it? Um, it did. and, and it's, and, and you know, it's now 2023. Maybe this is something the U.S. and NATO in turn, or by default, want, wants to ha have continued. Well, Stoltenberg uh, is in some senses a loose cannon. He'll say all kinds of things, uh, even sometimes without not checking, without checking uh, with Washington. Uh, the way things are evolving on the ground now is very, very key. Uh, the so-called Ukrainian counteroffensive is being mauled by Russian forces. The Ukrainians have sent their best people, trained, equipped by NATO. And they've been defeated at these four these four days. So that changes everything. Okay, the counteroffensive has petered out. It will peter out. The more they do this, the more they'll lose. Okay, what does that mean? That means that the U.S. generals can say, well, as they have said, we gave the Ukrainians everything they needed. We gave them 98 percent. That's what they say. 98 percent of what they needed to win, and look what they've done. So. I see an opportunity out of, out of this disaster. What are they going to do? Well, Zelensky has become a real uh, burden, actually. He's a loose cannon, and he's demanding still more weaponry. Uh, the U.S., part of the U.S. is, okay, we'll give him $3 billion more. I think there comes a time where Congress and others say, wait a second, wait a second. Wait, are, are, well, they're losing, aren't they? And we gave them 98% of what they need? Uh, and our people are kind of our own people, our Americans, you could use this money. The question will come down to the kind of funding that we needed in Vietnam, that we needed in Nicaragua, when the Congress finally says, this is a, this is a hopeless thing, this is a fool's errand. We're not going to give any more funding. And as you know, uh, even who, who, who admitted that, uh, I guess, Burrell, uh, the EU uh, foreign policy expert admitted that without any funding, uh, Ukraine would go down the drain. I think he said in two weeks. Germany said it in one day. <laughs> okay. I think that's well. Well, well give us give us a window of time though. When you say this, like if uh, Ukraine is losing that badly with this counteroffensive, which many are saying that's indeed what has happened, and some are even saying this dam explosion. Uh, was uh, a distraction, so uh, not to show how much Ukraine may be lost. But how much of a window of time do you give that, Ray McGovern, in terms of uh, the U.S. saying, well, we gave them 98 percent? Well, it, it really depends on, on the jockeying in Washington, as I see it. Uh, there's a State Department with Victoria Nuland and Blinken running things so far, and they have Biden's ear. But by and by, uh, uh, the generals and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the people who don't want to get involved in a, in a nuclear exchange with, with Russia, are gonna, gonna have to stand up and say, well, look, you know, we gave them 98% what they asked for. They've really taken it on the chin. This is an embarrassment for us, uh, these, these super tanks that we gave them. Uh, should we really send those Abrams tanks in there, be destroyed like the others? So 
What I'm seeing here is a jacking for what's the risk, best policy now. Can we really defeat okay. Russia without encouraging World War III? I don't think so. That's the paradox. That's the irony. As I say, we've been trying to tell Biden that for about five months now. For, look, look into it, folks. You can't have both. You have to choose one over the other. Sure. Let's hope and pray that he, talk, he, he chooses a ceasefire and negotiations before it's too late. Uh, uh, what do you think, Don DeBar? Do you agree with Ray McGovern there? I, I agree that that's the game. There, there, there are some other elements. Um, it's either Saturday or Sunday uh, this week, the 10th or the 11th of June, um, there is supposed to be a massive uh, war game uh, taking place in NATO uh, with, the, with the largest air uh, force uh, you know, war game in the history of uh, NATO. Uh, taking basically the scenario is responding to an attack by Russia on a NATO country. And so that means that there's going to be a massive air armada uh, in the air go, flying you know feverishly towards Russia at the same time that this game is going on on the ground in conjunction with this offensive. Um, I don't know, looking at that from Moscow or wh whatever uh, bunker the uh, top brass in the military would be viewing this from, it would look remarkably like an invasion force. Uh, and the only way you would know that it isn't, I think, is if it stops at the border or doesn't. And so I, th I think we're playing with fire in the middle of a pile of gasoline uh, with uh, three or four uh, people with various types of mental handicaps also playing with matches standing in the same puddle. <laughs> okay, in closing, Ray McGovern, I do have to mention this. Uh, w w when you have the Russian President Vladimir Putin talk about his t uh, the uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, weapons that are going to be deployed uh, in um, Belarus, the tactical weapons, when uh, he has said that if our national security is threatened, uh, nuclear weapons may be in the, in the, in the works. Um, and I think all agree that he follows through on his threats. When you have what happened with the Kherson Dam, which uh, aside from it, it being a natural disaster, it threatens, still is threatening the lives of many thousands of people. Um, and given what's happened on the ground with this so-called counteroffensive, isn't it time then for this uh, really to come to an end? And I think you've mentioned that that's probably something that's in the works now. But uh, given all that, don't you think the time is ripe now? It is. The, the question is whether the U.S. side realizes that Putin, I think we can count on him to be very cautious, to just grind away, just grind away. And after the counteroffensive, such as it is, uh, the road will be clear to go all the way up to the Dnieper River, which I think the Soviet forces will do. Whether they will take Odessa, that's the big, that's what uh, Putin himself called the Yablaka Razdora, the apple of discord. Will Odessa uh, be a, a, a place that they'll have to okay. fight over, or could it be uh, a way to work out things so that Odessa sure. could remain in a, a in a truncated Ukraine, so that that Thank Ukraine you. would have access to the sea and therefore be a viable nation? Uh, that will be the deal, as I see it, and as I say, Putin has already suggested that. Thank you so much, Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst from Raleigh, North Carolina. Don DeBar, thank you, activist and commentator from Austin, New York. With that, we come to an end for this edition of the Spotlight from the Cover Top Way and the team. It's goodbye.